Welcome back, everyone. Today, I have a very, very special guest. Now, the last time we met like this, I did an interview with someone that was willing to share their story anonymously and discuss all the different dark roads that they've been on and what they had to go through to take them to the road of success that they're on today. Every single addict and every single person has their own story. They have their own situation that they've dealt with and no two stories are similar. By far, they are all very different. I have a very special guest today that wants to come and share his story. And I want to welcome to you guys, Mike. Hi everyone, Michael Shimanov with you. And uh, let's do it. Welcome, Mike. So first, just tell me a little bit about yourself. What do you do? I'm 36 years old. My name is Michael Shimanov. Uh, I'm an Aries. <laughs> um, there's that laugh. I love it. <laughs> you get some more of them. It's good. Um, I work with my father. We have a jewelry store in Brooklyn. Uh, that's what I do during the day. And in the evening times, I fill it with writing, with reading, you know, exercising, living life. You I do, do some acting too. I've seen you guys, you do some acting I on did, Instagram. I did some work in that field for a little bit, but what kind of pushed me away from it was the message needed to be clear. It's like, what am I saying? I have the platform. Why am I doing this? Why am I saying this? And I just didn't want to be someone's puppet anymore. So here we are talking about a message. Yeah, I'm talking about a very important message. Yeah. So now you work with your dad. You've been clean for a long time. It wasn't always like this. No. Tell me how life was like for you in high school, college life. Um, I went to yeshiva, so it was very contained. School, work, school, work, no time for shenanigans and balagan. Um, there was a defining moment when I was 16, um, actually flatlined wow. when I was 16. It was the first time I decided to drink alcohol, but I was on medication for acne and I didn't know that there was going to be an adverse reaction and that I could have mixed the alcohol with the medication, I ended up flatlining, crossing over. So your heart stopped for a couple, it was about 10, 15 seconds. Wow. And at that age, what do you do with that information? with all that knowledge and power, I'm like, I don't know what the fuck to do. I just kind of pushed away from it, ran away from it. And then at 17, our house burned. We lost all material. Like we literally lost everything. And it was kind of rough on me. And that's when I started smoking weed, which is wild because I was just walking home one day on Main Street and I just find a bag with a bunch of dime bags. It was filled with weed. I was like, what is this? What am I going to do with this? So I ended up selling half of it and I'm smoking the other half. And that was all she wrote. And then um, moved into college, and that's where it all kind of started, the madness, you know. I felt the city life for the first time. I got out of my shelter. I got out of my cocoon because they tried to protect me with yeshiva. They tried to keep me with work and just, no, 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 don't go anywhere. Don't do anything. Don't. Straight. Yeah. And once I felt the city life, it was... Once you felt the freedom, the party life. Ooh, the action, the pace. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it got me here. Yeah. But it was good in the beginning, right? It was fun. Absolutely. I romanticized the life of the gangster. It was incredible. It was, I mean, it's, it, you know, what? I just watched. Life, life was like a music movies. video, yeah, basically. Way too many movies. Way too many movies. And then you, oh, this is real life, brother. You know? Tell me about a time where you felt for the first time it was really, really getting serious for you. The problem with the opiates uh, really, really started after I caught a case. I was 23 years old and um, it got rough. I didn't want to deal with what the fuck just happened. My parents kind of knew what was going on. They didn't call me on my birthday. I'll never forget that. And I was like, something is wrong. Yeah. And they found out and then I denied, denied. No, what are you talking about? I'm not hustling. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. They didn't talk to me for two months. And the first time I spoke to them was a phone call from the precinct, from Brooklyn. And I was like, guys, I need your help. What was their what was their initial reaction when you when you told them finally? Probably devastated. I mean, it, it all happened so fast and in the moment. I don't think they had time to react until I got out a couple of days later. And I'm just like, you fucking idiot. You know? It's like we told you. We told you. I was like, listen, what are you gonna do? And how long did you deal with that legal problem? Uh, it was back and forth, courts, courtrooms for about two years. And those two years must have been... And that's where it all started. That's really when it got heavier, not, oh, not right. easier. We have the recipe. We have the perfect recipe. If you're here, try it. Try this concoction. Do half a bite, do half a perk, take half a Cialis and go fuck. 
go enjoy yourself. You're going to fuck like a champ. You're going to be, you know, and I was like, oh, this is nice. So not only is it numbing me from my pain and my responsibility, but I'm also, I feel like, you know, mm, in the sack. And I was like, oh my God, I'm the best. I'm the man. The ego. Ooh. Now, I want to touch on that. I have spoken to a lot of people that have admitted <clears throat> anonymously because it's a little bit of a, you know, it's an intimate detail. They admitted to me that the way that they started taking drugs on the party scene was because really someone told them, um, you know, hey, if you want to do well with a woman, this is going to really, really help you. And I think that's such a very underrated thing to talk about because it's a very common thing that I'm being told in secret. And you pretty much just confirmed it. But is that how it starts for a lot of people? Mm. Having sex on ecstasy is not like having sex regularly or making love. And you're not making love anymore. You're disconnected. Yeah. You think you're connected, but it's fake. It's fake. It's not real. It's, it's bullshit, essentially. There are moments where it feels like, oh, wow, this is profound, but it's really not. It's bullshit. Try getting to that point without anything. It took me forever to rewire myself and to feel again. Everything got so numb at some point. Yeah. Like... The air didn't feel the same. The sunlight didn't feel the same. Nothing felt, food didn't taste the same. Nothing completely, completely jaded. And that's situation. called anhedonia, which is lack of pleasure. And that happens when your receptors just completely go mute after too much dopamine that's, has been excreted. That's how it feels. It's like, all right, here's the connection. And this, and you know, you get further and further and further away. It takes time for that to kind of, you know, mesh and kind of find itself. I, I, it was a fucking mess. What was rock bottom for you? <sighs> the last time I relapsed, it was right after my divorce. It was during the divorce already. It was when I was kind of at an end in my relationship. I just, I didn't want to deal with shit. I completely wanted to run away. I wanted to escape. I didn't want to deal with the responsibilities. And that's where it got really bad. I went from doing three to four uh, blues, 30s, 30 milligram uh, roxies, they would call them, oxys. Yeah. I would go from doing three to four to 10 to 12. Wow. Yeah. Like I went from a functional high to like, I'm a fucking crackhead. You know, I was junked out, just nodding off, mouth open. It was bad. It was really bad. It was ugly. Very ugly. What did you, when you, do you remember just what your state of mind was at that time? Did you just feel like, like I'm worthless. I'm just going to keep doing this. Or did you really want to stop? And you just didn't know how to kill myself. Like I, Cause I'm a person that feels a lot. I'm very, yeah. very um, in tune Empathic, to feeling. Yeah. I wasn't feeling any, anything anymore. I wasn't dreaming anymore. My soul was completely dead. It, I eradicated it and I stepped on it to the point where it didn't exist anymore. And I had to ask myself, Hey Mike, you're dead inside right now. So you might as well just go ahead and do it or choose to live your life. So what was the break? What, what was your turning point? How did, how did you turn it all around from being at that place? It was rough. Um, so I was getting junked out and I'm sitting in the car with my father and I'm nodding off. My, I'm like mouth, Just eyes, wide, yeah. open, mouth wide open. I'm, I'm out. I'm knocked out. And I wake up and my father's looking at me and he's like, are you fucked up right now? And my father doesn't talk at all. He's very to himself. He's very, he's very stoic. You know, the, the typical man. Is he a Scorpio? No, no, no. Thank God. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I say that because my dad's a Scorpio and he was very stoic. He was like, man, a very few words. But go ahead. Continue. Go ahead. I think it's the generation period. It is. Yeah. I was just going to say. They came here and they had to be shit out. Yeah. They, they didn't have excuses. I think their trauma made them the way that they are. They're, they you have to turn their emotions here. off. Yeah. I, my parents came here with nothing. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. They picked themselves up on their own. You have to be strong. You have to be stoic. You have to be. Absolutely. And he's looking, and my father never talked to me. He never, he would always kind of shy away from that. Like he doesn't like confrontation. So for him to say that to me, and I was just like, Bob, I'm like, what do you want me to say to you? I'm like, do you want me to lie to you? I'm like, cause it would just be a straight up lie. I'm like, yeah, I'm really fucked up. And he broke and I've never seen my father break before. And he, he started crying, like bawling. And I've never shared this with anyone until I didn't, I didn't tell my family, I didn't tell him. It was a moment between us, but I guess people need to hear that, like, you're fucking breaking the ones that are around you. My brother, my sister, my mother. Like, I'm still trying to mend relationships with my siblings because they looked up to me. And now, like, 
okay, time has passed. Well, yeah, not now, now, but working. yeah. And I know they, I know they see it, and I, I know they can feel it. Yeah. But yeah, seeing my father bawling like that, and then I cried my face off for two and a half hours, and I said, okay, it's time. You're hurting not just yourself; you're hurting the people around you. It's selfish. It's very fucking selfish. But that's the thing: you don't care. Yeah, you, you don't, don't give care. A shit. You don't care in the moment because your one goal is to get your fucking fix and you don't want to feel sick. You, everything revolves around getting your fucking high and then you can go on without you. You can go on about your day. You know what I mean? It was wild. How'd you turn it all around? Oof. Many attempts, many attempts at trying to clean myself. I took myself to Miami one time. I went to Puerto Rico. One. I didn't believe in rehab. Rehab for me was very, okay, you're going, Maybe I shouldn't. I, this is just my way, by the way. Yeah. I'm talking. About no, this is recipe. your process. Absolutely. This is my recipe. I want to talk about what's helped me because maybe it'll help somebody else. But it just I didn't believe in going away because I felt like you still got to come back. You still have to deal with the shit that you, you're not dealing with now. The triggers, the people's places and things, the associations we create. I'm like, OK, I, I, I just I didn't see myself going there. Yeah. So I'm like, I got to do it on my own. I found a good therapist. I went to a clinic. It was on uh, Jamaica Ave in Queens Boulevard. She was incredible. Her name was Miss Robinson. Just talking to her was like the beginning. It was the first part. I had to admit that I had a problem. I had to be super aware, super, super aware. And I had to give a fuck because that callous disassociation and shying away from your responsibilities, it gets you nowhere. Yeah. So... I started with the therapy and then I, I, I kept fucking up while I was in therapy. She's like, Mike, there's an option. We have an option for you. Maybe, maybe you want to try it. And it was called Vivitrol. Mm -hmm. what, is that? A, huh? what is that? What's Vivitrol? So Vivitrol supposedly suppresses the cravings. The way they explain it to me is, mind you, I'm not a scientist. I'm just, this is, you know, it basically suppresses the cravings and they explain that alcohol and the opiate receptors are in the kind of the same place. Mm -hmm. So they said, you can't drink and you can't do any of that stuff because you can overdose and you, it's fatal. Yeah. But in order to do Vivitrol, you have to be clean. And I'm like, but that's fucking half the process. That's hard. Yeah. The withdrawals, the cold, the, the lonely, you feel like you're breaking on the inside. It was terrible. The cold, the cold is what people are afraid of more than anything. I feel like. I was cold to my bone. Like I'm cold now because the AC is not on high enough, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but it's a different kind of cold. It's a prickling sensation. It's un it's, it's like a bone. numbness. Yeah. It's to the bone. It, it, it shatters your hope. It, it kills everything inside of you. I've seen patients six months out. They couldn't like, they still didn't come out it's to themselves. A year and a half to warm up. Yeah. But now when I don't get cold, yeah. I'm like, Oh, like if I can be that cold, like this is bullshit. Just breathe. I've also learned to breathe, but not from here to breathe from here and to relax. And um, I didn't tell anyone. I decided I'm going to clean myself out in Israel. I told nobody what I was doing. I went there. My family out there welcomed me, gave me a place to stay, but they didn't know what was going on. They just thought I got sick and it was right before Shoshana. So I was like, all right. Rosh Hashanah comes, it's three days already. I'm withdrawing for three days. I'm sweating, I'm all fucked up, I'm cold. They're like, no, 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 no. Let's go, man. No more. No more of this being sick. We don't know what's going on, but you're not going to be sick anymore. Yeah. That's it. It's kind of like flu symptoms, it looks like. Yeah. That's exactly. Dali in your soup. They gave me a warm soup. And then sitting with the family that night for Rosh Hashanah, I was like, wow, it's a new beginning. It's happening. Yeah. Because physical withdrawals last up to three to four days from personal experience. It's the mental shit that you got to really work on. You know, like, where are your insecurities? What are you running from? If you weren't, maybe you got molested. Maybe you got, in, maybe you got into a huge fight. Maybe you got stabbed. Maybe something. Maybe you lost a loved one. Maybe, you never know what someone's scars are, you know? Yeah. I mean? So I came back. I started doing the shot. And it was once a month. But I was fainting. I started getting seizures. And I, was like, and I wasn't telling anyone. I was scared because it was working. But at the same time, I was like, what the fuck is going on? This is scaring the shit out of me. I'm not a person that's prone to any of these things. And then I had this epiphany on Thanksgiving Eve. It was that same year. And we all decided to do a bunch of mushrooms. My friends and I. Because I couldn't drink. I couldn't smoke. It, it was just reacting really bad to the Vivitrol. And I sat there for three to four hours, like a mime. And I felt like I was in a blue test tube. 
I literally felt like I was in a test tube. And I was like, Mike, you're an experiment. You're letting them literally experiment on you because they're, the sample size was so small on something like this that, like, where are you going? I just didn't want to be that person anymore. And then Ms. Robinson left the clinic and I was like, holy shit, what am I going to do now? The person I've had for almost two years to talk to is leaving me. The shot is leaving me. What am I going to do? And then I decided I'm going to start following my passions. I went into theater. I went into acting studios. I, I tried everything. I, I started living again. But in that work, I realized, because you're doing movement work, you're doing voice work in the theater and the acting, they're bringing out all the grass, all the dirt from inside of you that I buried so far in me, into me. I was just like, oh my God, I have so much more work to do. I haven't even scratched the surface, but I knew I was on the right path. And here I am five years later, still cold (laughs) because I'm kidding. (laughs) Well, that is, yes, we gave him some chai. So... Collectively, how long have you been clean? Five years. Five years. Five years. I wanted to harp a little bit on the actual meaning of the words. Yeah. Because I want I wanted you to explain what is the difference to get clean and being sober. So clean to some people means no drinking, no this. No, I still smoke weed. I have I still drink from time to time. Sobriety is moderation and indulgence. Some things you can indulge in. Like, I don't have the problem with the drinking or with the smoke or who knows, but I just don't see it that way. But with the opiates, I can't fuck around. It, it, it's the line is so fucking thin, you know, that is now, your poison. And now today, today we're living in a whole new world. You can't even experiment with drugs anymore because they're being laced with fentanyl. Yeah. And that's also something we should talk about. And it's something the parents should know, too. And really the whole community and whoever's watching or listening to this, you're being poisoned, not you, but. The kids that are dying are being poisoned. Yeah. They're not overdosing. They're yeah. being poisoned. So I had a remedy for that. One, either walk around with a drug testing kit. They're not expensive. Test your drugs. And I know someone who's trying to escape and who doesn't give a fuck, it's the last thing on their mind. I know. But here's my rebuttal to that. What if one day you don't feel like being a junkie anymore, which is garbage, waste, all that nonsense? What if one day you're going to decide to want to you know, fix your life and kind of get out of that little funk? You have to be alive in order to do that. Surviving a nightmare is the title, right? You have to wake up from a nightmare, right? But if you're dead, you're not waking up. You're fucking gone. And it's the people around you that are left to deal with the burden. It's the families. It's the parents. It's the mothers, the fathers, the siblings. They're the ones that suffer. You're gone. You're done. You're finished. You got off easy the way I see it. Testing drugs to make sure there's nothing laced, like a fentanyl Test kit, correct? And what else? No, uh, Narcan. And Narcan. Spray. Yeah. It's easy. You just, and you're good to go. I think at this point, there really should be discussions about having them in restaurants, across the board, everywhere, because as much as people don't want to talk about it, uh, people do do drugs at weddings, at bar mitzvahs, at, at parties. And I see it. I, we, uh, we still see it. You go there and you see, and you never know what anybody else is going to be doing. But if you are doing something irresponsible, we, like you said, people are being poisoned. We should not at least, a, it's not just opiates. It's, it's everything. It's in fucking weed. It's in everything. It's in everything. It's dangerous. And it's not worth it to do a line and to die. That's fucking crazy. Back in the day, we used to be able to experiment and just try different things. And now it's just like, hey, maybe it's a sign. Stop trying to escape. Stop fucking around before it's too late. You know, it's not worth it. Do you, do, do, but do you, move, do you regret like ever starting, even like taking your first pill? Do you regret that? Or are you genuinely in a place where you feel like this all had to happen to you? I wouldn't be the person that I am today yeah. had I not went through all of that. I wouldn't be into volunteering. I wouldn't be into literature. I wouldn't be into giving back. I, I wouldn't be this kind person. I, I wouldn't be the Michael that I, I don't recognize myself. Seriously. Listening to class. Well, that, well, that Michael died. That Michael's gone. Buried him. Yeah. I'm listening to classical music. I'm listening to jazz. It used to be fucking house music all day. And now it's like, who is this person? So I hate that I hurt people around me along the way. Like, that's what bothered me the most. It's my mom, my father, my, my, my siblings, my grandma. It's the people that I loved around me. That's what I regret. I regret hurting them. But I, they were the last thing on my mind in that moment. I wasn't thinking at all. It was literally the most selfish thing I could have been, I could have been doing. What are some things that you do to keep yourself out of trouble? Like having a creative outlet is one thing. Are you still on the shot? 
No, absolutely. And I think you're not even three months. Wow, that's great. The first three months, and, that's it. and that was it. Therapy is huge. I haven't been to a therapist in a couple of years because I feel like I I have outlets. I do a lot of writing. I write a lot. I write for hours. That for me works. Journaling works for me. Vitamins are huge. Vitamins are excellent. B12. I don't need the B12 because I have a ton of energy, but it's good for energy. Oil of oregano is good. Vitamin D is really good. Oils. Yeah. Um, what else do we have? Uh, Siberian ginseng is great. And this is for people coming off and in that moment as well. It helps a lot. Valerian root helps with the sleep. Well, we have magnesium. Excellent for the cramps and the muscle spasms. That's more on the vitamin side. Acupuncture changed my life. So, I mean, what's wrong with re-stimulating your body? Yeah. Right? Because we're fucking our nerves up. We're killing our neurotransmitters, right? Not to get, I don't know enough about the science to get scientific about it, but. So we, so what happens is um, it takes about a year for your um, neurons to rewire themselves. So like I said, there's a lack of pleasure, um, even the cramps, the prickling uh, at night, lack of sleep, all of that takes exactly, it, it takes exactly a year for people to tr- go back on their circadian circadian rhythm, which is crazy to me. Um, So that's why it's very important what you bring up, the vitamins, the acupuncture. People don't understand that there's some people that are, you said you had a car accident before this when we spoke. You had a car accident. Obviously, there are going to be pain points in our life, right? So what do you recommend for somebody that has a problem with opioids? They cannot take opioids for the pain, but you still have the pain to deal with. So what do you do? There has to be other avenues. So for in your instance, you said acupuncture. What other things besides the physical did acupuncture help? Mentally, what did it do for you? Acupuncture mentally, it gave me strength. Gave me a lot of strength because the way Dr. Kim explained it is it's electric. You know, you're waking up, you're stimulating, you're re-stimulating your body which was really cool. And speaking of that, um, I just had surgery, my appendix ruptured, and it was excruciating pain. And I got, I told them, I don't want any painkillers. Don't give me anything. And after a day I I broke, I couldn't do it anymore. And they gave me um, dilaudil. I felt that rush to my brain and it was the scariest fucking thing I've ever felt. And I was like, you know what? I think I'm just going to deal with the pain. I don't have a right. You just have to be strong. Yeah. You have to be brave. You have to be strong. Don't be scared. It's just pain. And you can literally shut it off. If an acupuncturist can hit a point in your ear and shut off that message, why can't you? It takes a lot of work. You have to care. You have to give a shit. You have to be, it's a lot of effort. Yeah. It's, it's, it's mind over matter. I do. I do see that the people that do survive this, it's a lot of willpower and it's a lot of strength. And you mentioned that, you know, you write, you have an outlet this is a higher power. This is something that you, you see a, you, a purpose. That's, that's you, another thing. You have to believe in something greater than yourself. Yes. That's the first thing. Yep. Cause we're all very egotistical people. Well, I can't say you, I don't want to, uh, maybe there are some people that are above it. Well, uh, addicts, addicts are very selfish and they're very egotistical ego. people. You get there. You, yeah. Yeah. He goes huge. And I had to believe in something great. Some people call it God. I call it the creator. Yeah. Okay. You have to prayer. Prayer was huge. Reading scripture, huge, the Elim, Psalms, Proverbs. I can start quoting you pages and verses. It's there. And it's meaningful because it's, you're actually reading it. You're not just saying the words. No, no, no. You're actually understanding, understanding it. it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. People have gone through this before. We're not the first ones. We're not going to be the last ones. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with taking advice. Take advice. Seek advice from, get seek counsel. It's okay. I read this um, line in a Dumas book and it said, People only ask for advice to not take it. And if they do take it, it's so they can blame you when it doesn't go through. But still, there's nothing wrong with taking, I'm like completely turned everyone off. Then what's the point, right? (laughs) That's how this whole life is. It's a back and forth. It's a push and pull all the time. You just got to find your center and work on it like a motherfucker. It's hard. Let me ask you another hard question. Did you have a romantic attachment to the drugs? Of course. How do you, how did you get over that? Because I've spoken to a lot of addicts that have a big problem with just that. They're still say, I won't have the craving. I won't even have a problem to deal with that. I want to run away from. I miss the romantic part of the, and it was, and he was talking about heroin. He really misses or missed that whole process. And that pulled him into relapses more than anything else around him pulled into relapses. 
And I feel like the people that say that and admit that it's very powerful because you're admitting basically to giving in to those desires and pleasures, which then leads to giving in to that drug. Now you had a romantic connection to some of these drugs. What it was smoking the joint. It was crushing the weed. It was rolling the joint. It was crushing the pill. It was snorting. It was, I learned that it's very dangerous to create associations. It's super dangerous with the song to a person, with a food, to a smell. I don't do that anymore. You can't. It's very, very dangerous. And that's where the triggers come from. It's like, oh, I, I'm on the same street that I used to cop from. That's a trigger. Yeah. But I created that association. Beautiful verse, beautiful line. If you believe you can damage, believe that you can repair. Okay, so if you put that thought in your mind, you can also take it out. You have to work on yourself. But what does work mean? Work is labor. It means to suffer, the book of job. So maybe not work, maybe not suffer. Effort. Use a different word. It's effort. Put the effort in. Give a shit. Some of these kids, they go to therapy and they go to rehabs all over the world. They go to Bulgaria. They go to Israel. They come right back. They relapse and die. Now, poison versus not poison, thats the fentanyl problem is in and of itself. What I want to address is we have the facilities. We've made it very clear that there are definitely places, especially in New York, we're not lacking. You say put in the work. What does that look like in the sense of how do you stop those triggers from getting to you, from affecting you? Because that's really the underline of it is. I know a lot of people that will say getting clean wasn't the hard part. It's staying clean. That really is the hard part. And there's so many people that I know that will not live their life a certain way, or they won't even come back to New York because they just can't be around that environment. But to those people, I say there will always still be something that comes up in life. Life is not going to be this pretty picture. It's going to live inside of you and it's going to follow you everywhere. How do you tackle those triggers? Because a trigger is just that. You're getting triggered. You're not thinking clearly about what's going on. It's a trigger and you react instantly. For parents, it's obviously their child's cry. Your kid cries because they just fell. You're, if that's a trigger for you to come run to their aid. Something with drug addiction, something so powerful with drug addiction, years can pass, right? Years can pass. You're driving by that corner and you see that dealer. Something happens to you. Something very powerful, and I think that as an adult, even adults cave into this, but children, um, especially children that have not yet relapsed, really not have gone through the hardships yet, we want to give them a chance to kind of go through those relapses because it doesn't always happen the first time around. Many people actually doesn't happen the first time around. They go, they go through hell and back like many times, many rehabs, many journeys before they actually find what sobriety is in their own process, in their world. Some of these kids aren't getting a chance. What is a way to fight this trigger? This is a big question that I'm getting from parents that I don't know what to tell them. They say, okay, I sent my child to rehab. We're back in this neighborhood. Even moving didn't help. Eventually they come back here. They keep on getting pulled to go and get from this dealer, from that friend. Something happens to them where these environments, it becomes like familiar slash uncomfortable, but they eventually get back on that same path. How do you stop that? And I know that's not a simple answer. You have to give a shit. You have to want it, correct? You have to choose, to this have life. To choose life. Life is hard. It's not easy. Nothing worth having is easy. It's cliche, but it's true. You have to be uncomfortable. You will only grow when you. The people that are going through this actually have the most potential to be fucking great. Yeah. Seriously, because I believe that. I heard someone tell me a crackhead will always find a way to smoke crack every day. You have to wake up and be a crackhead when it comes to your life. Right. Now they find a way. They will find a way. Imagine that energy to pivot. actually, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Pivot it. And if you believe you can suffer, believe that you can also not suffer. Focus the energy in a different direction. The problem is a lot of people are searching for that purpose. It's yeah. like, why? For what? What's, what's the point? Yeah. Right? Does this shit really matter? We don't know. I kind of did see what's waiting on the other side and it's beautiful. It's light. We're all electric currents. We're light traveling through this beautiful world. Embrace it. Well, we are as Jews, we're souls and these are just our vessels. Embrace it. Yeah. Embrace it and feed the soul instead of numbing it. You know what I mean? Give an example of that. How do you feed your soul? Prayer. Prayer, Prayer. is huge. And I challenge myself. You talk about the will. What do you do? How do you... 40 day challenges. It's something I started for myself. Travel for 40 days, eat a certain food for 40 days, uh, abstain for something for 40 days, write for 40 days. And with each challenge completed, you get stronger and stronger and stronger and the will gets stronger and then the desires move into a different direction. 
That's it. It's, it's, yeah. It sounds easy, but it's really not. It's not easy. It's not easy. You have to really, really, really fucking want. It's How hard is it to change? It's hard to change. You, you have to, first of all, care. You have to be aware. Oh, my God. That's hard. Like, but it's possible. If I'm sitting here, it's possible because I was a fucking nut job. I was a maniac. Seriously, I don't know how me and my crew are all still alive. And I'm not the only one. I had a group of friends and we all came out. And according to percentages and averages, like not one of us should have at least been dead or two of us. We, we made it and everyone did it in their own way. Some went to clinics, some did ibogaine, some, some went to rehab. It, everyone has their own. That's why I feel like, hey, I'm going to share my recipe with you. Maybe you can take some of my ingredients and tinker with it and wear the suit, custom tailor the suit to yourself. Like when you do your nails, you get a haircut. It's custom tailored to the person. So is this process. Everyone has their own way. What do your parents say about your sobriety now? Like you guys are probably closer I'm so now. Happy. They're All happy. I ever wanted when I was a kid was to know who my father was. I wanted a relationship with my father. Me and my mother were very close. We spent a lot of time together. She invested a lot of time into me. She was amazing. And, you know, if not for the roots that she planted, and if not for the fact that she's a boss, I might not have made it because she made me a badass motherfucker. When I, when I look back, I'm like, man, that's why she beat me. I mean, she didn't actually beat me, but... They didn't give up on you. No. Beating, you know what I mean? They didn't the give up on you. Yeah, oh, no, never. She fought... Tooth and nail with me. Tooth and nail. Uh, and um, I finally got what I wanted. I got that relationship with my father. But when I started working with him, I was around 25, 26. I was still fucking mad. So I was back and forth, back and forth. I was clean for about a year and a half. I was doing well. And then life kind of snowballed again. But once I really, really cleaned my act up, like our relationship has just flourished. For real. My sister and I are finally, you know, we're there. My brother and I, we're, we'll get there. I feel the love. I feel his disappointment, you know, but I also learned to draw a line in the sand because for a while they didn't know how to express themselves. You know what I mean? So I had to set a, a boundary. It's like, I can't be your punching bag anymore because they need the outlet. Who can they talk to? I feel so bad for them. Yeah. But I'm like, I can't take the hits anymore. Yeah. Cause you have to focus on you and it pulls you down every time anymore. to that place. You're reminding me. Yeah. You're reminding me of my fuck ups. Like I'm trying to move past them and move forward. Hold my hand, you know, don't get in the way. So once I drew a line in the sand, started respecting myself, they started respecting me even more. And then they can see it in my behavior. They see it in my action. They see the growth. And when I'm good, they're good. You know, I see so much potential in you in terms of just you. You are such a light in the room. It's just such a refreshing conversation to have with someone who is genuinely self-aware. I can smell bullshit a mile away. Mm. And I've spoken to some addicts that were probably high as a kite while they were talking to you like, nah, nah, I'm clean. And some of them were very, very convincing. Um, I see in you that you genuinely do the work. And I don't judge any addict because I feel like we're all a little bit addicted to something. I say today the biggest addiction is social media. I'm upset for our children's generation. I think social media is very, very powerful and it can be like heroin for children because that validation of the positive comments and every time you get a like, we actually have a hit of dopamine that gets released. Speaking of that, the word addicted, what does it mean? To devote, give oneself to a habit or occupation, to sacrifice, to betray, to yield to impulse, tendency, compulsion, pursuit, we're all addicted to something. Absolutely. When you really break down the, and you clarify the word, we're all addicted to something. Yeah, we live in a world where it gets extremely hard and they're literally hitting us, hitting us. Where else in the world do they have an opiate epidemic? Go somewhere else in the world, only in America. Again, we can't, we get into pharmaceutical, we'll fucking end up, they'll end up killing us. I am not suicidal, right? I'm not coming after them. It's a yeah. business, I get it. They run the country, but you talk to other people out there like, what's Viking? What's yeah. Percocet? Yeah. They don't know what it is. Heroin, okay. Well, it hit our market, the American markets our in the 70s when Big Pharma came out and said that so it's not addictive. Forgive me for cutting off. No, no, it's okay. No, I said we, you know, our markets got flooded with it with Big Pharma. And yes, for the record, I am not suicidal either, but <laughs> we'll, we'll avoid certain topics because unfortunately that is a dangerous world we live in. You, you um, talk about things like Ibogaine. You're no longer going to have a TikTok account. <laughs> you, talk about TikTok? you cannot talk about Ibogaine. See, they don't want us to get better. Ibogaine is illegal in America. Why do you think that is? They don't want us to get better. Of course not. 
And for anyone that wants to know, please Google Ibogaine. It's I-B-O-G-A-I-N-E. You can find information about it. I do not have the plug to get it, but I have heard miraculous stories by it. But unfortunately, it's not legal. It's not a legal way to to uh, pursue here. But it, what it does is it does um, reset the receptors right away, like not going through that year and a half struggle of actually resetting it naturally. It is incredible. And it's a plant and it's natural. But I still feel, and there is, there's a reason I'm bringing up Ibogaine, there is no quick fix for this regardless. I know people that have relapsed after trying Ibogaine. They've done, they've done it. They've gone to Costa Rica. Internal. It's internal. And I, and I love you as a guest because you actually do a lot of the internal work. And I know a lot of people that will say like, oh, I didn't do rehab. I just kind of white knuckled it. And I stay home if I get triggered or, and that's not the way because something will get you and you're not living. Exactly. If you're white knuckling it, you're encaged. You're encaged. You're, you're still the rat in the rat. We all are to a degree, but we can, we can go on for days. What's your message to kids that are fucking around with stuff when they're messing around right now with drugs and they think like, oh, this is not a big deal. They say the, um, the teacher only shows himself when the student is ready. You're not alone. You're not alone. And it's, it's okay. You know, this will hopefully find someone, but you have to be ready for it. You have to want it. You have to admit you have an issue, but just to let them know that they're not alone. They're not alone. What do you think is something better that parents can do to better connect with their children? Something that found me on one of my 40 day challenges. Uh, I went away for a cross country road trip. I was like, oh, just go away for 40 days. And I found this book called uh, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And I think it could help parents. I think it could help people in general. I'm going to just cut it short. The first one is be impeccable with your word. Think before you speak. Think of the words that are coming out of your mouth. Really put some thought. Sleep on it for a couple of days. Don't, don't react, maybe. Just might. Number two is don't take things personally which a lot of us have issues with. Mm -hmm. It's not about you in that moment. Like your kids don't give a fuck about you. They don't, they're not thinking of you in that moment. Don't take it personal. It has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Like absolutely nothing. They didn't go and embarrass you on purpose or whatever it is that you they're think. Yeah. Thinking of yeah. They're not thinking about you. Three is don't assume. And God rest her soul. My, uh, my old English teacher, seventh grade English, Simon Goldstein. She said, don't assume because you make an ass out of you and me. Miss Goldstein, the little one with the short hair? You know Miss Goldstein. She had really, really small skirts all the time. She was older though. Yeah, yeah I had Miss yeah. Goldstein in school. Nice. You know That's Ms. crazy. She, she passed passes. away. Wow, I didn't know that. May she rest in peace. It was a good teacher. Yeah. And number four is always try your best. Always try your best. When you leave it on the floor and you say, I gave it my all. And to the parents, man, just talk to your kids. Give them the drug testing kit. Give, don't test them because they're you're going to push them away. Get the drug testing kit for them. Get them the Narcan pen. I also think gossip is very dangerous. Whether it be truthful or not, a lot of people are worried about how they're going to be perceived. And it takes a lot of courage to go. I'm, I'm patting myself. No, it absolutely does take a lot of courage to do this. Up here. You have to have this. I have to not give a fuck about what everyone is going to say after this, because I don't know what the reaction is going to be. And a lot of people can't do that. It's built on that gossip. Maybe we stop it for a little bit, you know, whether it be truthful or not, Yeah. you know, but again, this is my recipe. I don't want to make it personal. I don't want to upset anyone or kind of rub someone the wrong way. Cause it takes a lot to admit that you're one of those people, Yeah. you know? So maybe we all start working on ourselves a little bit. We have to be the change we want to see, you know, and if 100%. your kids learn, Parents have an obligation to children from their infant stages to their late teens. You have to plant those roots in your kids. I just watched this amazing movie. It was called Detachment. And it was about a substitute teacher and his kind of story. And they have a scene where none of the parents come to the parent-teacher conference. So where, who's, is it the kids that are the problem or is it the parents? But now that's a lot. It's not fair to the parents either because you can only protect them from so much in this world but plant those roots so that when shit does hit the fan, even if they kind of wither away a little bit and they get blown away, they come right back to it. Like the strongest of trees. You know what I mean? Build it, build those roots. I have a, I have something that's very good as from Proverbs 
Chastise your son, for there is hope, but do not set your heart on his destruction. What does chastise mean? Punish for the purpose of correcting. Advice, instruct, to set or keep right. Help them, but don't break them. You can verbally abuse them. You can physically abuse them. I don't break their hard. spirit. I know. Yeah. 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 You're absolutely right. A lot of parents and a lot and our Baharians, because they grew up on tough love. love. It's cold. It's, it's so very cold. cold. It's very aggressive. Yeah, and so the, you pull it, Joe. Yeah. You could have gotten the extra credit. Yeah. hundred percent. Just say you did a good job. <laughs> yeah. Give me a hug. Say yeah. I love you. Yeah. If my parents didn't love me the way they love me, I would not have made it. hundred percent. I had the support at home. My God, they, they don't even know. I would be in their house withdrawing. I would sneak out of the backyard, call a cab, go to my connect, come back. Like everything's, you're feeling awfully good today. You know, you were fucking dead two hours ago. What happened? I drove him through the ringer. You can't give up. Father called me today. Literally called me today. He's like, Mike, you need to speak to my son. Like, give me his number. Mike, I don't know what to do. I'm now I'm talking with the son. Mike, I don't know what to do. I'm going to take myself to the hospital. I'm like, dude, you're not going to get better there. You're not going to get better at your friend's house. You're not going to get better in a hospital. You're gonna, they're going to make you want to do more drugs. You go to the clinics, they give you Xanax. They give you opioids. They do, yep. They get, not opioids, but uh, the methadone. They'll give you a lara- oh, The methadone. Yeah. Fuck, lara- all that stuff. It's, it's more drugs. You can't, they're, they're putting a Band-Aid on. You're going back into the system. Yeah. Nah, it's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. Methadone, big no-no. Big no no. I, I tried that shit. I was buying it on the street. Horrible. The wonky, the, the breaking, the withdrawals lasted for almost three weeks. That's fucking painful. Because regular, I think. I want you to get better. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a business at the end of the day. It really is a business. That's why I wanted to sit with you because it's not about money. I've spoken to a lot of people about this stuff, but it's about do you have insurance? Let's send you to a clinic. Let's yeah. Send you to that. Yeah. We have, oh, it's 5,000 here, 4,000 there. Oh, let's put you on this medication. It'll help you. Now they have a medication so you're not constipated when you're doing the fucking drugs. Because, you know, you can't take a shit when you're, you're completely clogged up. Now they give you something so you can poop and still not feel pain. Like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, they, they will address all the symptoms, it's but so, they still so want... Fast. Everything yeah. is happening so fast. Yeah. It's, it's a fucking... It's, it, it's a jungle. It's a jungle. Opioids are genuinely one of the most difficult things to be addicted to. So once you get pulled into that world... Full-time job. It's a, not only a full-time job, you're getting sucked into like hell. You're getting sucked into hell and you're trying to hold on and you have your parents and the friends that care about you. They're trying to pull you up and it's the same equivalent in my head as you literally pushing them off of you because you're not letting anyone help you and you're going to fall and you're going to fall. And that family, they're the ones that have to burn the brunt of, of, of they really have to carry that. And I've seen what it, this does to the families. I've really seen it. A lot of them are just left broken. If there is no repair like this, if there's no light at the end of the tunnel, whether it's an overdose or that person just stayed on drugs, the families stay broken. They don't even get the therapy that they need. And the gossip is actually contri- contributes to the gossip. I believe everyone needs therapy. Everyone needs therapy. A hundred percent. Someone to talk to that's not going to judge you. Yep. That's not going to point a finger at you and just let you be you for a second. And oh, so much nerves bottled up inside. You can feel it. It's palatable. You can feel it. Just go talk to someone. It's okay. It's okay. Fuck what everyone is going to say. You keep living based on the chatter and what, then what? You're a mess. I have to say, I used to think that therapy was such a joke. And when my parents happened to be sick, my uh, nursing manager had told me like, you know, have you ever considered a bereavement group? And a bereavement group is a group that you go and you can like kind of discuss all the different stories of what it's gone through or what you're going through because you just lost a loved one. And I got to tell you, that was life changing for me. I was so angry and I didn't realize I was an angry person until I sat down. Like I wasn't an angry person, but this was an angry moment in my life. I did not even realize I had this uh, hurt that I had all around me, first of all, with the the people, the way people were perceiving the death of my father and my mom being sick. It was like, why doesn't, why don't, why don't more people care? I felt so angry with God. Why did he do this? My parents are good people. And not to get into the details of my own personal life, but therapy is really what brought me back to, first of all, like a decent, humble place of, wait a second, this is not everyone's fault. Like, relax. This is not God's fault. It was only then that I actually was able to explore all the problems in my life across the board, problems I had with friends, problems I had in my marriage even. I didn't even know I had those problems, but until I actually sat down with someone completely unbiased. And when I say unbiased, it's like, she doesn't know the community. She doesn't know who I am. 
And I felt like at first it's not going to work because I'm like, you don't know how things work in my community. She's like, try me. Why don't you try me? Like, you think you're the first person that, you know, she's like, I have girls in here coming in with a hijab. They think that I also don't understand what the Muslim culture is like. I'm educated enough to know. And I have a lot of experience. Like it just talk. And it, it really changed my life. I can't talk about it enough. And I didn't come from a family where that was prevalent therapy talking. I didn't think it was even needed. I was always very vocal. Like it's, taboo. it's very taboo for some reason in our community. I was going to say this because I'm, I'm publishing some work in a little bit, but what's in the word culture? Cult. Yeah. So it's a culture. It's a cult that's matured. It's evolved. It's taboo in our culture, in our community. Absolutely. Asking for help is taboo. Finding out that someone has a drug problem is look how taboo it is. Like no one wants, do you know how long it took for someone to come out and say, hey. I want to give them hope and let them know that it's okay. It is okay. And I'm going to say it again. You're not alone. And maybe this is where Kaiko Media puts like a little thing with my phone number on the bottom. You guys can call me at any time. Call me. And you're awesome for that. Anytime. Sometimes all it takes is just one phone call just to talk to somebody. To know that you're not alone. Because it's a scary world out there. Yeah. And you can only be prepared so much, especially in New York City. It's yeah. madness here. You got to make money. You got to pay your bills. You got to move. You got to move. If you're slow, you get left. It's a lot of pressure for young guys. For everyone. For everyone. And let's not forget the pussification of men. Yeah. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. Pull your socks up and get fucking moving. I want to reiterate that getting therapy should not even be in that level. Like the pacification of men that's happening in real time. Alpha males are becoming more and more depleted. The liberal logic has really set in into our society today. And it really is affecting the future generation, if not the current one. There's a lot of indoctrination going on with people just... And, and you know, it's, it's the system here too. Like they create selfish children. The culture here is not it. It's very selfish. The culture here. It's like you live your own life. Forget about your parents, put them in a nursing home. We didn't grow up like that. I used to rebel so much against it. And now I can't get enough of it. Yeah. I, I'm obsessed with my mom. I want to freaking be with her all the time. She doesn't know how to get rid of me. I want to always be with my family That's all the time, but it wasn't always like that. And it's not really, it's not really pushed to that when you're growing up in school, it's kind of like, Ew, you know, your family's gay. Like come hang out with your friends come be with us it shouldn't be like that your family's there but this is for the families you need to show support you need to show your love i think that people need to stop berating their kids for being human okay children are going to experiment with stuff you need to have an open dialogue with them about these things if you need to use this video as an excuse sit down with your kid open youtube and watch the entire thing with them if you're watching this as an adult and you think that they can benefit from it I would highly recommend it. There is nothing here that we do that we are benefiting from. This is genuinely an effort to make people want to reach out, ask for help if they need it, but really just address the fact that there are big problems in life. And if you are having a problem, talk to someone, talk to someone before it gets too late. This is a lot of work. This is a, a sitting, sitting proof and a sitting creation of years and years of work. And it doesn't end from what I see. This is a constant ongoing battle. Yeah. I have to wake up in the morning. I have to go swimming. I have to ex exercising was huge, by the way. Very good at stimulating all of those. Nerves. Well, it's nat naturally releases dopamine as well. Exercise is yep. crucial. Proper nutrition is crucial. You really have to watch what you put into your body. You have to watch what you have around you. Toxicity is real. You have to be careful with who you allow and who you permit into your life. You grant permission to all your thoughts, to all the people around you. It's you and you alone. So start taking responsibility for your actions. Do you love your life? Love it. I can't get enough of it. I'm freaking the fuck out because I know it ends at some point, but then it's like, hey, you were already there. So you know it keeps going. It keeps going. It doesn't end. The work doesn't stop. We've actually, I think we've been put here for those challenges to clean up my act. So maybe in the next, I'll be all right. You know, because I know I knocked down a few of these little fucking monkeys that no more. You know, it's nice. I love my life. I can't get enough of it. I wake up every day and I'm like, I made it. Are you grateful? I freaking made it. Yeah. I take a deep breath. I made it. I pray and I get on with my day. And you see your dad, you get to work with him. Every day. I love you, Pop. Every day a hug. Every day we talk shit. We crack jokes. He he, he hates the music I'm listening to. I'm like, what the fuck <laughs> happened to you, man? He's like, someone's, someone's going to die. I'm like, Pop. <laughs> I actually have a playlist just for him. Carl pop playlist, you know, because I'm like, all right, I know he can only listen to certain things. <laughs> I love life. Life is beautiful. Life is beautiful. Choose to live it. Choose to live it.
I want to thank you oh, thank for sharing you. this incredible story. And I really admire um, you, you you coming out here. You set it up, man. I was like, finally, someone's in it. Just, thank you. you. Know, they're, they're ready to kick ass and they're not afraid. So. And I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of people like you that you know, are afraid to share their story, maybe because they're afraid of the ca accountability that it comes with. Rip the bandaid off, have no fears. Anxiety is fear and that, that breaks you. So don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. Guys, in a world of Karens, be a Michael. I like <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. And thank you thank to you. Boris Kaik of Media again for giving us the space to do this safely. We really, really hope you guys enjoy these this set, this interview. And in this case, Surviving a Nightmare became one of the greatest success stories, honestly, I've personally heard. Let's wake up. Right? Let's wake up. Thank you, guys. Bye.